Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Welcome to the Business Growth Cafe. I am Angelo Ponzi, your host. We're going to talk about supply chain today. Now, this is probably not a topic we really ever thought about prior to the pandemic, because why? Because we never really ran out of goods and services, right? You were building a product, you needed some raw materials, you ordered it, you got it, not a problem. But when the pandemic hit, things started to get in short supply, right? We refer to this as supply chain. Now, as a consumer, just to jog your memory, you went to the grocery store, you walked down the toilet paper aisle and there was none. Right? The supply chain got disrupted. Products couldn't be produced, couldn't get here, and they tended to back up, no pun intended, out there in the ocean, sitting on cargo ships. Well, this hasn't gone away. Frankly, it's even gotten worse. Supply chain issues are rampant here in the United States and, and really affecting everything from us as consumers when we go shopping to industrial products, commercial valves, cars, high-tech products. Because the raw goods, if you will, the, the components are just in short supply. They're behind in manufacturing, they're behind in delivery, and the cost to even get them from, say, China to the United States has skyrocketed. Prior to the pandemic, people would talk about container shipping costs around $2,000, $2,500. Well, recently in conversations, it's as high as twenty five, dollars and some are predicting it'll get as high as $30,000. Now, depending on what you're bringing over, a $30,000 container cost, shipping cost, adds a lot of expense. So the question is, are you eating that or are you passing along to your customers or are you sharing in that? What's happening? So this supply chain issue has, has really become a big focus. I live in Southern California, and if you look out into the port of Long Beach, you don't see one or two cargo ships sitting out there. Now you see 60 and 70 of them just stacked up and lined up like airplanes trying to come into port. And is, is it because we're not letting them in? No, it's we also don't have the capacity, the trucks, the people to offload these cargo ships. So everything is backing up. So delivery times are getting delayed. Costs are skyrocketing and it's impacting the ability for us to do business and for us as consumers to buy the goods and services that we need. So today on the show, I have Richard Montalano. He is the founder of RAM Supply Chain, Inc. He is a supply chain consultant, an expert in everything supply chain, and we are going to learn a lot. We've got a lot of great questions that I want to dig into with Richard and really help try to solve this. But more importantly, is there an end in sight? When I think about costs that have skyrocketed, you know, we always have the saying, what goes up must come down. But I have found a lot of times when costs go up, they never go back to where they were prior to an event. So will shipping costs go back down into that $2,000, $3,000 range, or are they going to settle much higher? That's one of my questions. And I think it's a burning question for all of you that are listening out there. If you're nearly not disrupted by supply chain, and maybe you're a services company, one of your clients most likely is. So this is going to be a really interesting show. So I want you to stay tuned and I'll be right back with Richard. My company, The Ponzi Group, provides consulting, interim, and fractional marketing and leadership services with a focus on the strategic and analytical side of marketing. We take a holistic approach to driving business growth. Consider us your marketing architects. We use research to gather the necessary insights from your customers, prospects, the competition, and the marketplace to develop fact-based approaches to building effective and efficient growth plans. And, much like a general contractor, we partner with internal teams or carefully selected vetted individuals and organizations to execute the strategies and plans, as well as provide oversight and management to ensure we stay on brand and plan. To learn more about our services, visit theponzigroup.com. As I mentioned, I have Richard Montalano. He is the founder of RAM Supply Chain, Inc. And we are going to be talking about everything supply chain and how it impacts you as a consumer and impacts businesses or maybe your clients. Richard, thank you for stopping by the Business Growth Cafe. 
Hey, thank you, Angela. Pleasure to be here. We always enjoy the Business Growth Cafe. I've learned so much over the years from you and your guests. Uh, I'm just honored to be here. So thanks okay. for having me. Oh, absolutely. And, and you actually have been on the show before. You were kind of part of this uh, in the middle of the pandemic. I think we were doing little <laughs> snippets and conversations and challenges and, and that people were having. And and so I appreciate you coming back. And and I appreciate that you do listen. Uh, you, you told me that you like to listen to the shows. I think you told me uh, a week or so ago that you listened to one of them where you're taking a lot of notes and learned a lot from the show. And so I, I love to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. It's been very valuable. Uh, sometimes I put it on when I'm driving around town, just uh, trying to get some positive information in my head. And anytime I can learn it, from the Business Growth Cafe, it's, it's a good day. Well, it's good to know that my voice doesn't put you to sleep, especially when you're driving around. <laughs> yeah, officer, I was listening to this podcast and the, and the host just put me to sleep. <laughs> well, listen, before we start, why don't you tell the audience about yourself and your business? And, 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 and to kind of set this up, we are talking about supply chain today, and, and it is a hot topic. There is so much going on that is touching every business, every person, every Christmas toy that's coming down the pipe. There is, I can't think of anything in the United States of America that's not being touched or impacted by what's going on in the world. So I just teed it up. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Well, great. Thanks for that, Angelo. And it's it's very interesting how, how quickly time changes things. Before the pandemic, when I told people I was a supply chain consultant, they kind of gave me a deer in the headlights. Look like, what are you talking about? I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. And ever since the pandemic, you know, the first thing we ran out of was toilet paper. And, and believe it or not, uh, toilet paper kind of put supply chain on the map. Ever since, we've been running out of every other commodity. It was paper towels, lumber, electronics, aluminum, steel. Everything has been in short supply ever since the pandemic. And it's been an extremely challenging time, no matter who the company is, whether you're a mom and pop or whether you're a high-tech company like Apple uh, or Tesla. Any, everybody is struggling in the supply chain to get materials and to get logistics to transport those materials. So it's an extremely um, fast paced, dynamic environment right now. And companies that, that perform well, and one of the things I've learned from you through your podcast is, is you gotta be on top of it, you gotta be active, and you gotta be proactive in your business. Those are companies that are, that are waiting to happen are, are losing performance, losing market share and lagging others that are moving ahead to being proactive, talking to their suppliers, talking to their transportation partners and getting ahead of it. So that's that's the exciting part about it. I know it's extremely difficult, but for me as a supply chain consultant, it, it's exciting times because people are finally understanding the value that supply chain brings to the table. They got so used to just things appearing on the shelf and never had to give it a thought. Mm -hmm. until we ran out of toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know what? And and I remember those days running down the aisles and and uh, panicking and searching the internet to figure out where I could buy it from. So as a as a consultant then in, in working with your clients, like I mean, what what's the role that you take on? How, how do you work specifically with them? Good question. I, I first of all, I tend to uh, my mindset is I want to partner with these clients. I don't want them to assume 100 percent of the risk. I want to go in and bring my expertise, my experience to the table with them. So what I do is I, my approach is to to really understand all of the business needs. You know, what is their history and where are they going? And I do that uh, like a lot like yourself in that we pull a lot of the data analytics to really understand what's going on deep within the business. So uh, when I'm able to look three, four, sometimes five levels deep inside the supply chain, I can really help provide guidance. And that's really what I think of myself as a guide in the supply chain. One of the things I tell my clients and people uh, who, who, who ask for my opinion is, Going into the supply chain, we were at a huge supply chain talent shortage. And ever since that pandemic started, the, the talent shortage is just absolutely massive. Small to middle-sized middle market companies, 
have never had the opportunity to train or invest in supply chain training. And now they're thrown into a marketplace with less talent, less capacity into the most difficult supply chain talent in, in 100 years. Uh, so it's, it's a very difficult spot for them to be. And I like to bring my expertise and my passion for the supply chain to help those companies. And, and I focus on manufacturing and distribution companies uh, to help them get better, stronger, and more responsive to their customers. Okay. In, 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 you know, when we think supply chain or supply shortages, and we'll talk about some of the ramifications, I mean, China pops up. It is the first country that pops into my head. But is, is this shortage and these issues coming from most of the countries that we might import from or people might get their, their raw goods at the, or finished goods or raw goods to, in order to manufacture? I mean, is it, is it China? Are they the big behemoth? Or is it, you know, Thailand and Vietnam? Or, they, or is every country having problems? Every company. And one of the things that, that people are beginning to learn and understand is that the supply chain is a global community. And there are a lot of shared resources across the globe. And for decades, the mindset has been to lean out all of these operations across the board in every industry. Therefore, people took on the philosophy, we needed to have things just in time. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't work these days. Uh, that just in time assumed continuous flow or, or no disruption in that supply chain. That doesn't happen today. So what consequently happened is everybody shrunk their warehouses down the providers and trucking companies shrunk their equipment down and the container ships, all everybody shrunk. So whenever there's a hiccup, it doesn't take much for that ripple effect to, to ripple across multiple industries and sectors. For example, um, when you order a, an item or freight from across the ocean, whether it's Thailand or Taiwan, China or whatever, it's got to come across on a container ship and then it's, it comes through the port, usually in Long Beach or, or Los Angeles, and gets put on a chassis and then taken by a driver to a distribution center. Well, those chassis uh, and those trucks and those drivers are all in short supply in addition to the container ship. So every step along the way has been a difficult challenge. And we've seen unprecedented demands on these companies over the past year. And it's at the most difficult time when they just didn't have the equipment and the capacity to respond. Mm -hmm. Consequently, we have, uh, like you and I can see off the coast here in California, you know, 60, 70 ships yep. now sitting off the coast. I heard this just this week. That's the equivalent of almost half a million 20 foot equivalent containers. And that's just incredible amount of volume trying to come through here. Prior to the pandemic, it was common to only have one or two ships sitting out there. Now we're looking at, it's been 60, 70 ships uh, and continuing to grow. Uh, so if we look at the both ends of the supply chain here in the U.S. and, a, and, a, and internationally, so my assumption then is these ships are backing up to, to reiterate what you just said is because they're, the infrastructure here in, in the United States can't carry them forward, right? We don't have the trucks. We don't have the people. We don't have the warehousing. And to, to get that kind of volume. But since there's 60 or 70 ships sitting out there, is, is there still a problem at the, at the origin as far as getting stuff manufactured and produced, right? So it's not, a, it's not all just sitting here because we have a shortage here in the U United States, but there's issues at the, at the center uh, as far as where we get our raw goods or whether things are manufactured for us. Absolutely. Remember the underlying factor amongst all of this or the common denominator, so to speak, is COVID itself. Mm -hmm. and, and that hasn't been eradicated yet. So countries are still dealing with that. It's not uncommon for China or other countries throughout Asia to shut down for days or weeks at a time. In addition to that, there's other issues, uh, raw material shortages in those countries, as well as we've seen recently in China, for example, power being a problem, energy. They were shutting down factories for for days at a time. So all of these factors are really uh, difficult to manage and it really complicates every step along the way. But what it really, um, really highlights is that we're all connected and we're all sharing the same resources. We're all dependent on each other. 
in any hiccup, whether it's you know, on the other side of the world or in a container ship or on a local dock, it's all connected. Okay. You know, this is, uh, and that's an interesting part, right? It's, 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 so everything is so integrated these days that one little hiccup is like, you know, dropping the rock in the, in the pond, right? And you're seeing the ripples effect. I mean, that's really, really what we're getting right now. In, in looking at your business, you know, what's the forecast? I mean, is there an end in sight? Do we see this changing as far as the ability to, you know, beef up supply and to smooth this out? I mean, what, is this it's not going to happen tomorrow? It's not going to happen the next day. You know, a lot of the readings and things I see on the news is not going to happen at Christmas time. And if you're lucky enough to get that toy that you're after, it's probably at 10 times the cost of what you might have paid six months ago. So what's that kind of short term, midterm, long term uh, impact of this do you see in the marketplace? Well, it's, there's no doubt this is going to be a difficult uh, close to 2021. Um, most people had thought as recently as a month ago that by second quarter of 2022, we might see some relief. And that's largely uh, due to China having their annual shutdown, which happens around February time from where they shut, the whole country shuts down for about three weeks to give the supply chain some relief. Uh, but even now, a lot of people are considering that's not gonna provide the relief it once did. There's too much of a backlog everywhere. I'm hearing this could go well into 2022, even the end of 2022. We're, we've already heard, for example, the semiconductors mm -hmm. that supply out of the auto industry. That's backed up through the end of next year. Uh, I talked to a CEO of a small company that buys chips. And before the pandemic, his lead times were about eight to 10 weeks. When I talked to him about six weeks ago, those lead times are now out 52 weeks plus. Wow. So it's just going to continue. Um, and I wish there was an end in sight. I, I don't see the leading indicators telling me that uh, this is going to stop until I think really until we solve COVID worldwide, there, there's potential to be dealing with this for a long time. So one of my one of my clients is in the uh, HVAC, big commercial uh, building and construction, and they're a manufacturer rep firm. And what they were saying that it's it's not only product availability but it's supply so their their manufacturers that they deal with are telling them instead of getting the product let's say in three weeks now it's six weeks or it's seven weeks which means they now have to tell their customers it's seven eight or nine weeks and i would imagine that the manufacturers hearing from their suppliers everything's getting delayed right so it's a it's that ripple effect and and how do companies get control? I mean, is it is it is part of this single sourcing? Do, do people not? I know with one of my other clients who's in the Christmas business, you know, they get a lot of their product out of China. They get some of it out of Belgium. But one of the things that we saw last year was, you know, maybe they need to look at other sourcing places because this, depending on how this goes. So, do you get involved in a lot of helping companies diversify where they're getting their 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 goods from? Yeah, as a matter of fact, single sourcing can be a challenge, especially if that single source is on the other side of the world. One of the things I'm, I'm very bullish about is that I think we're going to start seeing more reshoring here to North America. I think we're going to, we, I've seen the beginnings of it. In fact, I talked to a client just a, just a couple of weeks ago about moving some of their supply chain out of Far Eastern countries and bringing it back to the US because the shipping costs have skyrocketed over the past 18 months, those cost advantages that they thought they were getting have begun to evaporate. In addition to that, where they thought they could get a product in just two, three, four months are now stretching out well over six months and beyond. So you're adding additional risk plus additional cost uh, to the equation when you might be able to get a much smaller order, much more responsive order if you can source that in, the, in North America. And that's what I'm beginning to see is a lot more North American. And it's not just the United States, but Mexico is also a valuable trading partner. The incredible amount of capabilities across multiple industries, whether it's machining, plastic processing, packaging, wovens, and all of those things they can provide. And they're so much closer. The supply chain is so much simpler. 
and lead times are so much shorter. So it really eliminates a lot of risk by going to a much shorter supply chain. Not to mention the environmental impact that can have as well. It's much, much more environmentally friendly moving it just a, a few hundred or a few thousand miles rather than across the globe. Right. Well, I would imagine shipping costs are coming down. It's, it's funny you mentioned packaging in Mexico. I have a friend of mine who is in the paper business, and one of his biggest clients is a, is a packaging company down in, in, in Mexico. But ironically, the, the stuff they're packaging are, are TVs out of the Far East. So it's, uh, <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. You haven't mentioned Canada, though. What's, what's kind of, how does, what role is Canada versus Mexico playing here on it, impacting the U.S.? Well, they, they do provide some specialized goods and services. Um, the, the advantages to going to Mexico are a little bit cheaper cost of labor, where you don't get quite the advantage from, from Canada. But they do have specialized uh, products, like some of the lumber industry that comes out of there. Um, but across the board, if you're looking for labor savings, it's probably more advantageous to go to, to Mexico to do that. Um, but there's things you can't replace, uh, maple syrup, for example, or, or things that come out of Canada that, that are only sourced in Canada. You, you right. can't replace that kind of stuff. But from a labor perspective, the, typically companies are going to be chasing that into Mexico. Okay. You know, one of the things that have been a kind of ripple effect of, of shipping goods overseas is the rising cost of shipping. I mean, people who say, hey, for container cost was $2,000 I heard a couple of weeks ago it was now $25,000 and somebody else was predicting 30,000 by the time we get to mid-year next year. So that cost doesn't necessarily get passed on to your customers' customers, right? So some, co some companies are eating it, some are not. But that's kind of my first part of this. You know, what do you see in that trend? But the other part is, you know, we say what goes up must come down. So I want your insights on the fact that these prices have now skyrocketed, but will they really return to pre-pandemic uh, price points when this is all over? Or will they settle higher? Instead of being 2,000, they'll settle back, but now they're 5,000 or 6,000 or 7,000, which again, rises cost of goods that we all as consumers end up incurring. What's your yeah. thoughts on all of that? Good question. And my perspective is that it will not come back to what it was pre-pandemic. I think uh, the demands will begin to normalize as we get into next year, second half of next year, which will help stabilize it a little bit. However, when you look at what companies have had to deal with, there's been skyrocketing fuel costs and labor costs. Uh, once you give higher wages and higher salaries to employees, it's hard to lower your cost after that. And that I know we've heard a lot of people from the Fed talking about transitory inflation, but once you give higher, higher wages to your employees, you, you can't take that back. And there's been incredible um, competition for employees across the board in every industry right now. Employees are jumping ship left and right. And I've talked to many manufacturers that you know may hire a group of 10 people to come work the production floor, and nine of them are gone within two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a really high turnover and they're going and jumping ship for the best, most amount of money they can get. So when it looks, when demand slows down, it will come down, but, but I don't think it's going to ever come back to pre pandemic levels. If we look at another industry, for example, airlines, remember many, many years ago, you didn't have to pay for loading your luggage. Right. But once they got used to charging those fees, they never gave it back. Right. <laughs> Well, some of them have, right, because it's a strategic advantage. You know, you're not charged for the first bag. But uh, for someone who's traveled and I in the one of one of mine or my wife's bag was over. I won't tell you which one. And <laughs> that extra two or three pounds was like one hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, that was just blew me away to me. It was like throw stuff away. We'll buy it on the other end. So you're you're right. Once once, you know, a market is established and people are paying those costs. Now, it might not stay at 30000 but it's not certainly going to go back to two. And, and those are things we have to, to take a look at. So it, during the pandemic, did, you know, I saw in, from a marketing standpoint, companies, you know, pull back their marketing budgets. They did things differently. They, they reacted. You know, the strategic alliances and partnerships that a company either had or needs to establish 
I think long term, if they don't have them, it becomes very important, especially if you want to look at preferential treatment or all those other kind of things. Do you get involved in helping to establish kind of supplier, customer supplier relationships as well? I mean, really setting those up for clients? Absolutely. And that's a big focus for me as well, because like I said at the beginning, the amount of talent, expertise and time a lot of companies have is just it's not enough to support a growing business. So the speed of the supply chain moves extremely rapidly. Technology advances extremely rapidly. And it's important to partner with the right companies that can help take you to the next level. Um, I've done a couple projects this year working with companies who had little to no investment into their supply chain. So it's no wonder they're spending millions of dollars and not getting the best value out of it. Mm-hmm. But when we came in and said, hey, look, let's let's stop. Let's look at the process. Let's look at the way you're doing things. And I, I pulled all the data and said, hey, you know, there's a better way to do this. Let's go out and set up a partnership with the right three PLs, which just to specialize just in this. And let's set up contracts and a relationship, a partnership that benefits everybody. Uh, unfortunately, they hadn't taken that mindset and, and they had a very transactional mindset. And everything was, uh, let's, you know, let's figure out the problem today and let's not worry about what's going to happen next month, next year, right? So companies tend, especially middle market companies, tend to evolve over time just trying to solve one problem. For example, uh, a marketing guy may open up a new market and say, Washington, and, and a sales guy says, we got to get 10 loads to this customer next week. Well, that, that's great. But once they get into that solution, they, they forget it. And they never, never go back and retest the marketplace, never go back and, and, and set up those partnerships. But that is critical to success in, in supply chain. It's one of the things I talk about as a key value driver is being able to develop competitive advantages. You know, we all think of Amazon as one of the um, pillars of the supply chain. You know, they've done incredible things when it comes to supply chain innovation and the whole prime really change the industry. In fact, everybody calls it the Amazon effect. Everybody wants free shipping and they want it here next day or the day after, right? Yeah. And that's that's not really feasible for most companies, Um, but they got to do a better job than than they do normally. And if they don't have the data, for example, and it's important when you have that data platform to be able to share that information, not only internally, but with your partners who can help, help be your eyes and ears out in the industry and can have your back when things are changing rapidly. And for example, if there's a capacity crunch and say, hey, you know what? We've got this other customer who's gonna eat up 30% more of our capacity than we had anticipated. We need to get your understanding where you're gonna be in, in that same time frame. Otherwise we may not be able to, to support you. It's those kind of conversations that really separate you from the competition and provide you accelerated supply chain performance. So. That's the stuff I really love and, and enjoy doing with my customers, helping them understand the value of that. It can really separate you. Yeah. Well, you you, you mentioned data, and, and data is is near and dear to me. That's a, one of the core things we use here in, in our marketing group is, is data. Um, but on the supply chain side, where how are you mining? How is a client mining, and, and where are they getting this analytics? Is it, is it a particular software? Is it their CRM? You know, where are they getting this and, and how do they best use it and understand it? Because a lot of times I find even market research at the end of the day, a lot of people don't understand what the data is telling them. So yeah. how do you work with them on, on, on data mining, data management, good, data utilization? Good question. And, and most of them aren't set up to, to really handle it. A lot of times I ask for data and it's just really not even available. So we have to create it from scratch. What, uh, where we often start is the ERP uh, system. And there is some limited data there, but it's often not robust enough. So what happens in a lot of cases, is we'll go back to their suppliers and ask the suppliers because oftentimes the suppliers have much more analytics than the actual client themselves. And I know this to be true specifically in the logistics markets they can give me a ton of information from the pickup points to the destination, to the rates, to breaking down the rates, including accessorial charges, fuel charges, any other types of charges that they put on there. Um, the weight, the pallets, number of pallets, dates, 
all these areas that are really critical to understanding the needs of the company. And most companies don't understand that. They don't know where to get it. But your, your providers have that information in a lot of cases. We just take that and put that into some kind of a data analytics platform. Uh, I oftentimes use Power BI to do that. Uh, a lot of companies will use Excel, uh, which, is, which is okay, not quite as robust. Uh, I've had companies in the past use Alterx, which is a fantastic uh, platform as well, or Tableau to create the visual graphics. Uh, but it really tells an, a critical story of your supply chain um, from start to finish. And we, we actually, in a lot of cases, pull data that's 12, year, 12 months. We want to look at the whole year so we understand the seasonality in a company mm -hmm. to really understand deeply what's going on from start to finish at that company. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, a client, I have a client who's seasonal and they have to be, you know, they're not ordering a product all year long, but they're selling all year long and they have to, you know, have that data to management and know when to order and how long it's going to take to make and, and how long it's going to take to ship and how much long it's going to take to assemble. Right. So without that data, they're, they'd be flying blind. Yeah. And, and, you know, they may, and, and of course they're dealing with, with everything we're talking about today. Right. So they make a place an order and now they got to place their orders earlier in order to get it on time and all this kind of stuff that's going on. So, so data management and, and supply chain as in, in the other aspects of a business is just extremely important. And, and so that this is, you know, an, an advantage and a tool that companies can utilize really to help them forecast and see and, and do all the things that you've been talking about. Yeah. And one of the things that, that I wanted to mention is it's also very visual and sometimes it's hard to understand numbers, but when you can put some of the visual graphics, like for mm -hmm. example, I was recently working on a client that had national distribution through Costco and Walmart. And when we plotted out all of the deliveries across the United States, it became pretty evident as to where their distribution uh, centers should be located. They had currently had them on the East coast and the West coast, but when you see it on a map and you say, hey, what am our biggest customers are in these areas and they're going here, it might make a little more sense to put our distribution centers a little closer to our clients, our biggest clients. That makes a heck of a lot more sense. And that comes from being able to create the data, create a visual graph that people can look at and say, wow, that, that, that doesn't make sense having our DC way on the other side of the country. Yeah. Well, and, that, and, and that's being strategic. You know, that's me, right? I, I, I want to be strategic in what we do. And that's a great example. I had a client who wanted to expand across out of Southern California, expand across the country. And, and to your point, where were the customers? Where were the prospects? They were, they were in the Midwest. They were on the East Coast looking at where those opportunities were. And then they had to look at, do we ship product from California to Texas or to Chicago or to Florida? or as should we put a distribution center someplace else? So, I mean, I, you know, it, it, they all intertwine. And I think the point I'm trying to make here is it isn't marketing, it isn't sales, it isn't distribution and supply chain and manufacturing. We're not all in different silos, right? We're, we're all the same pieces of the same puzzle. And without each one, the puzzle doesn't create and tell the story or the picture. And you use this word, this phrase already, and that's tell the story. The, um, the data tells the story. You have to be able to understand how to read the story and, and you know, understand the story that's being told. And, and so I, I find that very fascinating and utilizing Power BI and others, which use tools like that, to help create that visualization that simplifies and makes it easier to consume. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, it's so powerful to be able to put charts and graphs and, and visuals in front of a client that they can easily understand in just a few seconds rather than having to go through a, a 20 minute narrative on why this makes sense. <laughs> no, oh, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm working on a presentation for a client and I'm getting these spreadsheets, you know, with thousands and thousands and thousands of data points, you know, and I have to go, okay, how do I take that and simplify it into one chart, one visualization on a PowerPoint that somebody can understand, you know, having been in market research for a long time, I learned over the years, that you have to spoon feed it in a sense and, and make it very simple. When I first started the sidetrack for a second uh, and, and when I, in the action sports industry, my reports were like 500 pages with da data table after data table. And I mean, I was fascinating. I loved it. 
and I'd hand this to my client and they'd say, what the hell do you want me to do with this? I, 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 number one, I'm not going to read all this. And number two, I don't, I don't know what I'm reading anyway. And over the next 13 years in, in that industry, it got to the point where it was a chart, a pie chart, a graph, and an explanation. That was it. No more extreme details. If they wanted the details, happy to share it. And so, you know, again, making it easy to consume to be able to make intelligent decisions, because that's what the data t- lets you do, right? It helps you make intelligent decisions. And so uh, I, I'd say, I'm all excited about the data. Bye. <laughs> Um, you made a comment, which I'm, I didn't understand, and I, and I want you to explain it. So you're talking about branding in the supply yes. chain, and what does that mean? Yeah, very good question. And companies uh, really live and die by their branding. It really, really separates them in the marketplace. And it's important for your supply chain to live and breathe that same branding so you can live up to it. Uh, your brand is, is only as good as your supply chain can take it. If you have the greatest brand in the world, but you can't deliver, it's, it's not going to make a hill of beans to, to anybody. So right now, companies that can have a supply chain that can deliver their product is extremely important. I, I tell everybody, the best ability is availability. So if you, you have to be able to deliver and you can really outperform in the marketplace by just having... Uh, a supply chain that can perform at a high level and deliver. You know, I, I've worked with clients that support some of these big box retailers like Walmart, Costco, CVS, Rite Aid, and they have very demanding uh, performance metrics. Uh, in fact, Walmart uh, demands 98% on time in full. And that's not an easy target to hit these days for, for companies. But if you can do it and you can do it consistently, that's going to support your brand. That is going to help build credibility. Uh, nothing erodes credibility more than, than lack of availability. So um, that's one of the things that I think is critical. In addition to that, you also have to live that branding into your supply chain. For example, a lot of these companies that have a much more transactional mindset don't understand that that, that is portrayed out into their marketplace that they're buying goods and services to as well. So if you have a much more long-term mindset that you can, you can tie to your branding, um, you can sell that into your supply chain. Uh, and I did this just recently this year where I was able to help a company build that long-term vision that's part of their brand and sell that into some of the biggest brokers in that industry. The companies that were gigantic, and this was a smaller middle market company and yet we had multiple brokers bidding on their business that really wanted it. They wanted to be a part of it. They, they told me they, they, were, they were really competing for their business because they wanted to be part of that brand. And I think that extends on the end-to-end supply chain. And that, that's really what I, I believe is, is part of branding, that you can carry it not only to the customer level, but also to the suppliers, that they want to be part of that as well. Okay. Well, that, that explains it. And, and again, we're still talking about classic branding, so I, I, I get that. And, and to your point, I say to a client, uh, or I have said to clients, you know, it's about your brand promise. It's about your value prop. If you say, uh, you know, we'll deliver in 24 hours and you'll live in two days or frankly, 30 hours, you broke your brand promise and it an impact on your overall brand. And the same kind of thing is what I'm hearing you say is that the supply chain that you use, the promises that they're making, things that they're doing that influence my brand, you know, they all have to be in alignment Yes, and, and the supply chain has to deliver on their brand promise in order to ensure that my brand promise. In the restaurant industry, a lot of times we'd say you have branded products sitting on the table, right? You got French's mustard or or something like that versus Bob's really good mustard. Yeah, so it creates a different image about your brand if you have branded products versus non-branded products. Those kinds of things. All right, well, interesting. I love that. What do you think the biggest challenge is? Two things. Biggest challenges for for regarding supply chain issues going into this last quarter of 2021 and as we look to next year. And then the second part of that question is, what is your biggest challenge in growing your business? Oh, good question. The, uh, the biggest question, that, that, the biggest challenge, that, that is a loaded question there. <laughs> uh, I think no, one no of the softballs thi- here, no softballs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for companies, uh, one of the biggest challenges is just labor. It's just trying to find enough labor, not only internally in their own companies, but in their supply chain. And understand every one of their suppliers is dealing with the same challenge. 
everybody's competing for employees. And when somebody makes a promise to deliver and doesn't live up to it, it's, it's not that they didn't want to. In a lot of cases, it's their own internal, their supplier, and sometimes their supplier supplier and their supplier supplier that couldn't deliver. So it can go down three, four, five levels and everybody's struggling with the same issue and that's labor. Um, and once I, I've talked to so many companies over the past year, and it's one of the most consistent issues I've heard, that and the cost. And they actually work one, one A and one B because labor drives cost because in order to keep employees, you gotta pay them more mm -hmm. these days to keep them. Uh, so those are the two biggest issues for companies dealing with that is how do I, how do I handle the cost and how do I handle the labor? Okay. And what about you? What's for your me, biggest challenge? Yeah. <laughs> What's keeping you up at night? Well, actually, it's interesting. Like I told you at the beginning, most people didn't quite understand supply chain before the pandemic. For me, the pandemic has been, been good for my business because it's created so much more awareness. And I'm able to deliver my message that the value of the supply company has been really, really pick up. Uh, but the most difficult thing is getting the CFOs or the ownership groups to understand the value. And I really focus on four key value drivers for my clients. Number one, I help them understand that supply chain can help them drive cash flow by better performing their, their costs and prices across the board. Second, I help them build a foundation to scale up. So many companies, supply chain is always, always working on the edge. If you ever walked in and you feel like uh, you, everybody's hair is on fire, everybody you talk to, there's a crisis going on and you feel like you've taken their last nerve. That, that's because they don't have a, a flexible supply chain. It's not agile. It's not built to scale up. Uh, third, we want to help them develop competitive advantages, uh, much like a, an Amazon was able to do with Prime. We want to be able to have them outperform the competition in their industry so they can gain market share. Again, remember, uh, availability is the best ability. So uh, that's a simple thing to think about in, in anybody's respective marketplaces, but that can really separate you from the competition. And, and lastly, if we're doing all of those things right, we can tie that down to the specific, uh, how much cash flow or EBITDA we're driving, which will increase corporate value. So those are the four key value drivers we focus on from my company to our clients. And uh, that's, that's an exciting thing because people are beginning to get the message and the word is spreading and, and people are generating much more interest now. Well, you know, you made a great point in prior to the pandemic, you know, you walked into the grocery store, you walked down the aisle, you grabbed your, you know, Scott toilet paper or whatever you needed. <laughs> and nobody ever thought about the fact that someday it wouldn't be there. We saw, we see other countries where people are lined up for bread and, you know, other kinds of goods and services because, you know, there's shortages, blah, blah, blah. Never here do we ever expect to see that. And, and so I, to your point, I think everybody woke up to about supply chain issues even even so, when you couldn't find the grocery store, what'd you do? You went to Amazon, yeah. And, and then all of a sudden, Amazon was saying out of stock six weeks, eight weeks, yeah. Uh, you know, and and that was a rude awakening for for us here. And do you think? I mean, we all got slapped upside the head for sure, <laughs> and, and we're still getting spanked a bit. Do you think businesses took this to heart, or are implementing the changes that they need to make today? to ensure tomorrow, next year, you know, the next pandemic, God forbid, that they're prepared this time? I think it's it's slowly beginning to change. It's not an easy thing. Some of these supply chains are very complex. Some of them stretch deep. Some of them stretch across the globe. And it's not easy to just move a supplier out of China into your back door. Um, some of the proprietary specifications or engineering requirements are held by those companies. So you can't just pick it up and, and, and bring it somewhere closer. I do believe companies are beginning to understand the value. And I, I talked to you about why companies are beginning to nearshore or reshore product back here to the North America. And I think that's part of the, the risk mitigation strategy going forward is there's a lot of risk when you are sourcing product from the other side of the, the world. Uh, there's geopolitical, there's natural disasters, there's wars, there's tariffs, 
there's logistics bottlenecks everywhere. That's a tremendous amount of risk. And when uh, the decision by a customer in the end is, is made on the availability, when they get to that store and, and your product's not there, but the competition is, that's a big deal. So mm-hmm. that kind of stuff, I think, is changing the mindset of these leaders, the ownership uh, at these companies, and they're beginning to slowly do it. I wish it was much more rapidly, um, but I think we're going to see it begin to accelerate in the coming years. Well, it certainly should be part of the strategic discussion. Yes. And and so we don't all get, uh, and we, I don't, I don't have manufacture anything, but we also don't want our clients to get caught flat footed and, and talking about how they can't deliver products uh, a year from now when, when they've had a rude awakening and, and they should be taking advantage and contacting you, frankly. Um, <laughs> well, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate the insights that you're giving. And, and I, and I think for me, that I like to say to my listeners, if you take away anything from this is don't take things for granted. Just like your strategic planning from a sales and marketing standpoint, you have to put your supply chain in order. You have to plan, you have to prepare, you have to have your strategic relationships. You have to look at your sourcing. You have to do a lot of what if scenarios, just simply what if this happened again? What if China shut down? What if shipping, we got 200 uh, ships off the coast of Long Beach as opposed to the 67. That we, what if, what if, what if? We need to play those scenarios and be prepared to, to figure out what your steps are should that happen. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's tremendous amount of planning that goes into that, but yeah, I agree with you 100%. All right. Well, fantastic. This has been great, Richard. Why don't you tell the audience uh, how they can reach you, find out more information, your website, your LinkedIn, uh, your golf scores, whatever you want to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you feel free to follow me at, on LinkedIn at uh, Richard Montalong. You can find me. Uh, my website is ramsupplychain.com. Uh, feel free to follow us there as well. And look forward to meeting many of your listeners. And uh, thanks for having me. Enjoy yeah, absolutely. This has, been, this has been very educational. I really appreciate it. And extremely timely. And I, I'm glad we were able to do this. Okay, great. Thanks, Angel. All right, take care. Richard, I want to thank you again for joining me here at the Business Growth Cafe. Uh, That was uh, eye-opening, scary as hell, actually, but uh, it's it's where it's the environment in which we're living today, right? Those those external pressures. We talk about businesses; we tend to look internally and we look externally. These are definitely external issues that are affecting businesses today. So again, thank you so much for stopping by the cafe. And thank you, my listeners, for listening in today to this important conversation. As I always like to encourage you to take a moment, go online, give us a rating, give a comment, uh, share the shows with, with other peers that you think will benefit from this great content like you heard today. And if you're a subscriber, thank you. And if you're not a subscriber, I encourage you to do so. This way you make sure that you get alerted when a new show pops up. As I mentioned in my last episode, we are going to be launching an additional show called 7 at 7, where we're going to do a live show every morning at 7 o'clock for seven minutes. It'll be me, but I'll also have some guests on, and it's going to be quick. It's going to be a singular focus to either answer a question or impart some information. And that should be launching. Uh, The plan is by November 1st, so I'm gearing up for that. Content is ready and now it's just a matter of time and, and, and getting it rock, ready to rock and roll, so to speak. And um, also, uh, it, the Business Growth Cafe, it, myself as the host, and my company, the Ponzi Group, we are also going to be changing our name, repositioning a little bit, adding some more services, but, but going to be launching a, a new name for the company coming up, and I'll keep you posted on that. So again, thank you for tuning in today, and I look forward to talking to you next week here at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.